Okay, so we left off, we had talked about what all the parts of the cell do, okay, and then we had gotten through what I refer to as the big three, okay, the big three methods of cellular transport, okay, the big, the big three are diffusion, osmosis, and active transport, okay, which of those three is the most important for a cell? Diffusion. Diffusion is the biggest method of cellular transport because it's free, it works well over small distances, and it moves things from high to low, which is generally the direction things need to go in anyway. Right? If, if, uh, if an organelle is crying out for something, it's because there isn't very much of it there, and diffusion is naturally going to make it move towards that place from where it is being produced in high concentration. Right? So diffusion works pretty well. Okay? But we said that diffusion had one kind of drawback. Okay, and that drawback was that it is slow. Okay, it's slow, and like we said, it works only really well over short distances. Right? So if I have a cell that's like this, and um, let's say the material is needed here at the X, but it's being produced over here at the Y. Right? So worst possible scenario, it has to go from one side of the cell to the other across its longest dimension. Right. Diffusion is going to take it from here, where there's lots of it, okay, and it's got to move it over to here. Now, diffusion doesn't draw a line and say, okay, all you little things I just made, stay in this tunnel and get to the place where you're needed. Right? It doesn't work like that. Diffusion moves from high concentration to low concentration. Now, is it possible there are many places within the cell where this stuff is in low concentration? Yeah. And so what ends up happening is this stuff diffuses kind of outwards in all directions. And by the time it gets over here, the concentration might be a lot lower, okay? Which means that a lot of this stuff is maybe over there or over there, okay? So it's the same number of dots, but obviously they've spread out quite a ways from one spot to another. And that's just kind of in one dimension. Remember that a cell is a three-dimensional space. Okay, and then it is diffusing kind of in a spherical pattern outwards. All right, so that's the drawback. For the most part, that isn't a really big problem because cells are small. Okay, that's why cells are small. Cells can't get big because of this. Their volume, as they increase in size, increases exponentially compared to their um, to their surface area. Right, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, probably on Monday. Right, but it's a big deal as cells get big they'll actually become very, very inefficient because of this process. Okay? Active transport can't fix this. Active transport only works across a membrane. Right? It's only pumping stuff into the cell. So having an active way to get stuff from Y to X, there isn't one. Okay? That has to rely on diffusion. That's why diffusion is the most important. Inevitably, at some point, every material is going to move by diffusion. Everyone clear on that? Okay, so active transport, we said, was different because it's active, where diffusion is passive. Okay, active transport only works moving stuff across the membrane. Okay, can it move anything? Pretty much it can, other than like really big molecules that physically can't fit. Okay, those have to be engulfed by another method, which we're going to talk about shortly. Okay, and then the other method of cell transport, the other one of the big three was osmosis. Okay, osmosis is only going to move one thing water, and it's only going to move it where? Across the membrane. So it's like active transport in that way, except that it's passive. It moves only water. And why is it moving water across the membrane? To balance salts, right? There's either more salt inside than there is outside, or vice versa. The water is always going to move to where there's more salt in order to make the concentrations the same on both sides, trying to get a, an equilibrium. Okay? Everyone good with that? So quick review of those. Okay. Now, these are separate from the big three, okay? I very rarely ask about these other than like, let's say a multiple choice kind of question, right? But it's endocytosis and exocytosis. This is transport that's actually controlled by the membrane and involves a change in shape of the membrane, all right? So whatever is being transported by these methods is too big to move through the membrane, be actively transported, Okay, through the membrane, the carrier proteins are too small, it can't get through there, so it actually has to be engulfed, okay, and then taken into the cell that way. <coughs> 
All right, now, out of the cell is exocytosis, and it, we've kind of talked about that already when we talked about the, how the Golgi works. Okay? The Golgi apparatus kind of controls this process, so we've got stuff coming out of the Golgi here. Okay? It's in its own little transport vesicle, okay? and it moves towards the membrane, and because the vesicle is made of the same material as the membrane, when they come into contact with each other, they just merge. And when they merge, it, breaks, it kind of breaks the seal on that, on that vesicle, and whatever was in the vesicle moves out. Okay? This is also the way that hormones and things like that are secreted by your cell. Okay? If, you're, if you've got a cell that's like uh, in your adrenal glands or in your pancreas and it's making insulin or adrenaline, okay? it packages that stuff, those hormones that are made in the smoothie are, it packages them and sends them out in these vesicles. All right? So excreting wastes and secreting hormones works in kind of the same way. So that's the mechanism there. Exocytosis is movement out of the cell. Do we need to be able to use that term? We do. Okay. So if I ask you, what's the function of the cell membrane? You need to say, controls endocytosis and exocytosis, right? Because that's its job. All right. So there's only one way for stuff to get out of the cell, and that's it. Exocytosis. Getting into the cell, there's three ways. Okay. The cell membrane is, seems to be way more concerned with getting things in than getting stuff out. I guess maybe it's a hoarder. I don't know. Okay. It's just got to pack everything in there and never throws anything away. Okay. So transport into the cell we call endocytosis. Again, that's a term you're going to have to know. Okay. Um, and it's when we take macromolecules and particulate matter. Macro means... Large, right? Micro means small, macro means big, okay? So macro, macromolecules, so large molecules like proteins and fats and things that are really big, okay? Um, and particulate matter, so maybe like a big chunk of something that was maybe floating in your bloodstream or if we're talking about like uh, some of your immune cells, your killer T cells, they would engulf other cells, okay, by this process. All right. um, so forming vesicles, okay, that are budded from the cell membrane. So um, all three methods have the same mechanical uh, kind of operation. They, the, the cell membrane folds in a little bit and creates this kind of bubble, and then it traps whatever was in there. Okay? If we're talking about uh, cells taking in solid particles, it looks like this. And in fact, this is how the amoeba that we looked at last week eats. Okay? It simply puts the cell around whatever it wants to eat, and it just engulfs it, okay? And then after it folds in on itself, it's inside of a little vacuole or vesicle, okay? And that vesicle will merge with like a, lysis, a peroxisome and become a lysosome, and the food will be digested, something like that, okay? So if it's engulfing solid particles, we call that phagocytosis, okay? Sometimes a cell will need to get a lot of water into its cytoplasm very quickly, all right? And osmosis is probably not working for it at that point in time, or it's not working fast enough, okay? If that's the case, a cell will do exactly the same thing it did to engulf a solid particle, except it'll engulf nothing but the intracellular fluid, which is essentially water, okay? It's just going to make these little bulges and they're all going to be filled with water and that water will come into the cell okay, and, and it'll be more hydrated after that. Okay. And the last kind, okay, I'm sorry, that's called pinocytosis. Okay. Pinocytosis means taking in a fluid. Okay. And then there is receptor-mediated endocytosis. Remember how yesterday I told you the membrane's covered with all different kinds of antennas? Okay, and when it receives a chemical signal, the, the, the shape of the antenna and the chemical signal are the same. Well, when it receives that chemical signal, those chemical signals are macromolecules. They're proteins. They're too big to go through the membrane. So the cell engulfs them. So the receptor okay, receives the signal like this, and then it folds in on itself, just like it did with a solid particle of food or with a bunch of liquid, okay, and makes a little vesicle, and that vesicle will rapidly go to whatever part of the cell will affect the, uh, the signal from, from that hormone. Okay? So if it's insulin, it'll affect the membrane mostly. Okay? If it's adrenaline, it affects like mitochondria and things like that. Okay? Um, 
So basically, mechanically, it's the same. The membrane just folds in, and then it becomes a vesicle. Right? It's um, how many people have a, like a dog that they walk at home? Okay, you know how you clean up after it? Right? You put the little bag over your hand and pick up the poop. Okay, and then you fold the bag over. That's exactly how this works. Okay, you fold the bag in. You make a little space in your hand for the poop. Right? You pick it up and then you fold it over. Now you have the sealed container and you didn't actually have to touch anything. Okay, well, that's how this works. It's exactly the same process. All right? It's like picking something up with a bag over your hand and then folding the bag over it. All right, so um, specifically about each one, okay, in phagocytosis, okay, a cell engulfs a particle okay, by wrapping what we call a pseudopod. That, that means false foot. Pseudo means false. Pod means foot. Okay, uh, wrapping it around the uh, the material. In this case, in the picture here, it's a bacteria because this is a uh, white blood cell okay, that's engaged in destroying bacteria within your body. So it just engulfs them in and eats them. Okay, uses them as food. Okay, so everyone okay with that? Really, all you need to know is phagocytosis is the engulfing of food by the membrane. Okay, for pinocytosis, same thing, kind of mechanically there. It folds in on the liquids, and then we've got the liquid stuff in there. Okay, and this is actually what it looks like under a light microscope. Okay, so this is the, this is the membrane here, okay, this kind of black line, and you can see that it's folded in and made these little vesicles. Okay, and some of them are at different points, like this one here is just about to kind of pinch together right, and create that vesicle. You can actually see that here's one vesicle that's already been formed and it's just in there already. This one here is just about to seal off as well and become its own little vesicle. Right? So that the, the membrane just changes shape and engulfs things when it needs them. All right, now, understand this is pretty small. Right? This is half a micrometer here. Okay, so pretty small. All right, and then there's receptor-mediated endocytosis. Again, this picture is pretty much the same, except that we've got those little receptor proteins here that have received the chemical signal, and now they've triggered that process to happen. And under a microscope, it looks pretty much like that. So here's our membrane. Okay, the black line there is kind of the, the membrane. I'll draw it in red so it's a little clear. And then you can see there's stuff coming off of it. Okay, you can see these little kind of receptor type things, okay, and uh, and some of them are going, sorry, they're going this way. This is one right here, okay, and that's the hormone molecule that's kind of sitting on top of it, and that'll cause that thing to go, and you can really see them clearly here. There's a whole bunch of them, okay. Each one of those circles there, okay, is essentially a receptor with its chemical signal attached, and that thing is just going to engulf all of it, right. And you can see that the membrane is just about closed off here, Okay, and those that chemical signal will be taken in quite quickly. Making sense? Okay, so receptor-mediated endocytosis basically takes in okay um, chemical signals. Okay, you don't need to use the word lig ligand. Okay, but they're usually proteins like hormones. Okay. Again, these are ones that I would ask about in a multiple choice question. If I'm asking a written response question that asks you to explain a method of cellular transport, I'm going to be looking for the big three, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Okay, Because as you know, kind of involved as these ones are, they don't hold a candle to the big three. They don't happen nearly as often as the big three do. All right. OK. I would like you guys to answer those four questions. I'll give you a few minutes, and then we'll go over them together. While you're doing that, I'm going to hand back your quizzes from yesterday. OK, so color blindness is caused by a person's cells being unable to produce certain proteins. Where's their problem? What part of the cell has got a problem? Um, if there was a problem with the nucleolus, it wouldn't be able to make any proteins. This is only certain proteins. How do you end up colorblind? Anybody know? Okay. Being colorblind is genetic, which means the problem is in your DNA. 
Okay. If you you can only if there's only certain proteins you can't make, it's because the section of your DNA that says how to make that protein has a mistake. All right. It's the same thing if you're diabetic. Okay. The section of your DNA that tells you how to make insulin has a mistake. And so every time your cell asks for insulin, the nucleolus copies that section of the DNA, sends it to the ribosome, and the ribosome makes some protein that's somewhat like insulin but isn't quite right and doesn't work. Okay? So the problem lies in your DNA. The rest of the mechanical parts of your cell work just fine. Okay? So all, all things that are sort of genetic problems end up being expressed as you can't make this protein. Right? So if you are colorblind, it's because your body can't make certain proteins that are supposed to be present in the cones, that's the special color receiving cells inside your eye, okay, that receive color. Right? Mr. Van Erve down the hall, he's colorblind. Okay? Like almost completely. You can tell if he gets out of the house in the morning without his wife seeing him. Because he'll be wearing two things that just aren't right. We played a joke on him one day. We're like, hey, that's a great purple shirt you're wearing. He's like, yeah, thank you. It was red. He, was, he actually got to the point where he was like, everyone loves this purple shirt. Everyone loves this purple shirt. It was a red shirt. Okay. We, sometimes we mess with each other because we're kind of mean. Okay. But Mr. Van Erve is completely colorblind. And it's genetic. Okay. Just the, the chromosome, the X chromosome that he got from his mom had that section that wasn't right. And, of course, from his dad, he only got a Y chromosome, so there was kind of a bit of a problem there. So that, that's why males typically have color blindness way more. You almost never see colorblind females because they have two copies of the X chromosome where guys only have one copy. Okay? So color blindness is far more prevalent in males. Okay? So the problem is in the DNA. All right, number two, why is it important for organelles to have their own membranes? Excellent. Summed up in one word would be compartmentalization, right? We want to have separate environments for separate jobs because that allows them to occur more efficiently. All right. Uh, number three, what might happen if the lysosome's membrane were ruptured? Can you? Exactly. Okay. The enzymes that are inside would begin to break down the cellular material and the cell would eat itself. Okay. Generally, it would be bad. And number four, what problems might a cell have if all of the ER was removed? Okay, would be unable to detoxify drugs and poisons. What else wouldn't it be able to do, Jared? Wouldn't be able to repair membranes because it can't make lipids. Wouldn't be able to break down complex carbohydrates or produce hormones, okay? And if we're talking not just smooth ER, but rough ER, wouldn't be able to transport, okay? Wouldn't be able to transport proteins, okay? So we'd have, yeah. If you took away the ER, the cell would basically die because it wouldn't be able to do most of the things it needs to be able to do. Because remember, cells have to carry out the basic functions of an organism. If there are basic functions they can't carry out, the same thing's gonna happen to them as would happen to an organism if they had liver failure, okay, or something like that, okay? They're just, they're gonna die. All right. Questions on any of those? Okay. Daniel, sir. Uh, the smooth ER would you wouldn't be able to transport or synthesize lipids. The rough ER is what transports protein. Okay. Now this is also, guys, kind of the way I would ask a question on a test. Okay. I'm not going to outright say, you know, well, I might, but I would probably word it a little more in a little more complex fashion, okay? I would say, you know, a cell is having problems doing this, which organelle might not be working properly as opposed to what's the function of the smooth ER, okay? I probably would word it a little differently, make you process just a little bit more. All right, if there's no questions, we'll stop her there.